Barely three weeks after the death of African-American George Floyd, another black man has been killed by police in Atlanta. On the program today, we take a look at reactions from the latest killing, the decision on Brexit and the challenges of the coronavirus pandemic. Welcome to this edition of Foreign Dispatches on Channels Television. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Anne Mwawadu. Rashad Brooks is the name on the lips of many in America and in the world over. He was killed in a scuffle with police officers in Atlanta. Now, while some say the use of force was not necessary, others might argue that. But many are hoping that justice will be properly served. Let's begin the program today with the first step angry protesters took on hearing the unfortunate death of Mr. Brooks in Atlanta. The restaurants where he was shot was not spared during the protest. Protesters shot down a major highway in Atlanta and set fire to a Wendy's restaurant where a black man was shot by police as he tried to escape arrest. The incident was caught on camera and fueled more nationwide demonstrations. The unrest broke out after dark in Atlanta where earlier in the day, Mayor Keisha Lentz Bottom said she had accepted the prompt resignation of police chief Erica Shields over the death of 27-year-old Rayshard Brooks at the Wendy's. Images on local television show the restaurant in flames with no fire crews on the scene. Other demonstrators marched into Interstate 75 where they were met by police. Authorities say the two officers involved in the shooting were white. Brooks was the father of a young daughter who was celebrating her birthday on Saturday. His death from a police bullet came after more than two weeks of demonstrations in major cities across the United States in the name of George Floyd, a 46-year-old black man who died on May 25 under the knee of a Minneapolis police officer. Police were called to the Wendy's over reports that Brooks had fallen asleep in the drive through line. Officers attempted to take him into custody after he failed a field sobriety test, according to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. A second videotape from the restaurant's camera shows Brooks turning as he runs and possibly aiming the taser at the pursuing officers before one of them fires his gun and Brooks falls to the ground. Lawyers representing the family of Brooks told reporters that Atlanta police had no right to use deadly force even if he had fired the taser, a non-lethal weapon, in their direction. Now, this latest killing has worsened protests across America with the late Brooks family members demanding justice. No justice! No peace! No Hundreds of demonstrators marched to the Capitol building in Atlanta, Georgia this week following a weekend of similar protests over the death of Rayshard Brooks, a black man who died in an encounter with Atlanta police. Protesters marched with signs as they made their way to the Capitol building where they held a rally and changed chanted slogans like, Hell no, we won't go. Brooks' death reignited protests in Atlanta after days of worldwide demonstrations against racism and police brutality prompted by the death of George Floyd, an African-American, when a Minneapolis policeman knelt on his neck for nearly nine minutes on the 25th of May. What it boils down to... Lawyers representing the family of Rayshard Brooks told reporters that Atlanta police had no right to use deadly force, even if he had fired a taser, a non-lethal weapon in their direction. In Georgia, a taser is not a deadly weapon. That's the law. That's what the cops are trained to do. It's not a deadly weapon. I've had cases where officers have used tasers on victims and they argue with us in court that tasers aren't deadly that tasers aren't harmful. That's the case law here, that tasers are not deadly weapons. So before we even hear from their lawyers who are gonna say the same old thing they always say, you cannot have it both ways. You can't say he ran off with a weapon that could kill somebody when you say it's not deadly. 
Police were called to a Wendy's restaurant over reports that Bruce had fallen asleep in the drive through line. Officers attempted to take him into custody after he failed a field sobriety test, according to the Georgia Bureau of Investigation. What it boils down to, black, white, Hispanic, whatever you are, are you not tired of seeing cases like this happen? We see from the protesters, we see from the people in the streets of all races now, that people are sick of watching black men murdered. Video shot by a bystander captures Brooke struggling with two officers on the ground outside the Wendy's. I can even say we want justice, but I don't, I don't even care anymore. I don't even know what that is. And I've been doing this for 15 years. I don't know what justice is anymore. Is it getting them arrested? Is it getting somebody fired? Is it a chief stepping down? I know that this isn't justice, what's happening in society right now. The police department has terminated the officer who allegedly shot and killed Brooks. Another officer involved in the incident was put on administrative leave. The family of Rayshard Brooks, a black man whose death has reignited protests in Atlanta, has called for drastic change in policing and justice for their relative, who died after a police officer shot him twice in the back. The death of 27-year-old Brooks, which the Fulton County Medical Examiner's Office ruled a homicide, was the latest police killing of a black man to fuel nationwide outrage against police brutality and racial injustice. And people ask, how could this have ended? Why didn't, why did he resist? Why well, it could have ended there? Well, it also could have ended here. I can walk. My sister's house is right here. That's how this could have ended. It didn't have to go to that level. And that's what we're saying in America with policing is this type of empathy is gone. The trust that we have with the police force is broken. And the only way to heal some of these wounds is through a conviction and a drastic change with the police department. <clears throat> but honestly, true, true justice will never prevail because we will never be able to bring back Rashad Brooks. Brooks' fatal encounter with the police came after police responded to a call that he had fallen asleep in his car in a Wendy's restaurant drive through lane. No, there's no justice that can ever make me feel happy about what's been done. I can never get my husband back. I can never get my best friend. I can never tell my daughter, oh, he's coming to take you skating or swimming lessons. So... It's just going to be a, a long time before I heal. It's going to be a long time before this family heal. And I just, like I said, I'm just thankful for everything that everyone is out there doing. And I just ask that if you could just keep it as a peaceful protest, that would, that would be wonderful. Because we want to keep his name positive and great. Caught on video, the encounter seemed friendly at first, but when an officer moved to arrest him, Brooks struggled with him and another officer. An attorney for Brooks' family, Chris Stewart, said the police should have let Brooks walk home at, rather than pursuing and shooting him. Several members of Rayshard Brooks' family attended Monday's news conference in tears and spoke of him as a warm family man who loved to take his daughter skating. I didn't come down here to talk to the media. I came to love on my people. But if you ask how old this young black man was, look at your children when you see them laugh. That innocence, that joy, that pureness of soul. And you had a glimpse of what we lost. You have a glimpse of what it feels like. Because tomorrow, we're going to have to deal with it again. We're going to have to bear it, and we're going to have to say we miss you. And if we didn't say we love you enough, we got to apologize to him for not telling him that we loved him that much. 
Brooks's death reignited protests in Atlanta after days of worldwide demonstrations against racism and police brutality prompted by the death of George Floyd. Brooks's widow, Tomika Miller, implored the public to protest peacefully in her husband's name. She says the family would want to keep his name positive. Following several cases of police brutality and racism, a move has now been made by the United Nations Human Rights Body to hold a debate for, after a request from Burkina Faso on behalf of the African continent. The top UN human rights body will hold an urgent debate on allegations of systemic racism, police brutality and violence against peaceful protests in the United States and other countries. That's according to its president. We got a request from the African group to have an urgent debate uh, in the follow-up to what happened in America with George Floyd and the, the whole uh, tragedy which showed the problems of racism, of police violence uh, and the follow-up to that. The UN Human Rights Council's decision to hold the debate followed a request last week by Burkina Faso on behalf of African countries in response to the killing of George Floyd, an African-American, under the knee of a white Minneapolis police officer. His death has ignited protests across the nation and worldwide. The United States is not a member of the 47-member state forum in Geneva, having quit it two years ago, alleging bias against its ally Israel. The U.S. mission in Geneva had no immediate comment on the council's decision, but last week issued a statement decrying the senseless death of George Floyd and saying that justice and transparency were core values of the United States. Well, why have an urgent debate? I, I think that the African countries, that's the way I understand it, they thought that the situation was such, and also the demonstrations and the, the intensity of the public debate was such that you shouldn't just have a regular Human Rights Council session and you should really put some focus on that topic. I think that was their thinking. They, they want to show a sign that, that that is being done. They think this is one of the core jobs of what the Human Rights Council has to do. The African group's request in a letter made public by the United Nations said, the death of George Floyd is unfortunately not an isolated incident. The numbers of previous cases of unarmed people of African descent who met the same fate because of uncontrolled police violence are legion. The outrage provoked by the death underlines the importance of the Human Rights Council discussing these issues. The letter said, noting that 600 activist groups and victims' relatives had called last week for a special session. Protests have extended to the United Kingdom also, where many have said that even the United Kingdom is not innocent. These unending protests have pushed the Prime Minister Boris Johnson to demand a review in areas of racial inequality. According to him, Britain needs to stamp it out. Nice to see you. How are you doing? British Prime Minister Boris Johnson says that Britain needs to stamp out racism and discrimination that unquestionably exists, but also highlights the positive strides that has been made. Well, the whole point of having a, a review is to look at the, the areas where people feel that uh, there is more that needs to be done. So, for instance, we've, uh, we've already acted on uh, the Lamy uh, report we did stuff to and, and we will continue to do more to ensure that uh, for instance uh, young black males involved in crime don't automatically get moved to uh, to prosecution you try and sort things out you, it, you make sure that you have more uh, BA black and minority ethnic groups in the prison service in the probation service uh, more use of body worn cameras so you you know people have more confidence about the criminal justice system I think what we want to do is, is learn uh, now very fast what fresh changes we need to, to make. And I just what I feel most strongly is that 
there are so many positive stories that are so far that are not being heard and things really are changing and you're seeing uh, you know young young black kids now doing better in some of the most difficult subjects in school uh, than, than they were ever before. You're seeing more going to top universities. We need to start telling that story uh, and building up a culture of high expectations, of a narrative about success, as well as stamping out the, the racism and the, and the discrimination that unquestionably exists. So it's, it's two things I think we need to do at once. The Prime Minister came under pressure to deliver action on racism after he launched a commission on racial inequalities on Monday following Black Lives Matter protests. At the launch, he said a cross-government commission would examine racism and the disparities experienced by minority ethnic groups in education, health and the criminal justice system. But he gave few details about the commission, leading to criticisms that he was prevaricating rather than delivering concrete steps. An opposition Labour lawmaker, David Lammy, whose own report into overrepresentation of black people in the criminal justice system is one of the several whose findings have not yet been implemented, expressed dismay that steps are not being taken sooner to combat racism. Tens of thousands of people have demonstrated in British cities following the death of African-American George Floyd in police custody in Minneapolis last month. You're still watching Foreign Dispatches on Channels Television. We turn our attention now to the coronavirus pandemic and the latest move by different countries around the world to contain its spread while easing lockdown restrictions. Just as life is still beginning to get back to normal, a new wave of the coronavirus has now been seen in Beijing, China. The government is taking measures to contain it by imposing a fresh partial lockdown, but the WHO insists the origin of this new infection is not certain. The novel coronavirus recently found in Beijing was possibly imported instead of naturally occurring in the city. That's according to Chief Epidemiologist at Chinese Center for Disease Control and Prevention, Wu Zunyo. Beijing is taking swift steps to curb a new cluster of local COVID-19 infection that has led to nearly 80 new cases in the past four days, including shutting down a major wholesale market of Zinfandi links to all the new infections, imposing a partial lockdown in its vicinity, and ramping up mass testing and screening in key areas. During an interview with China's central television in Beijing, Wu said there are two possibilities of the import of the virus, namely the contaminated items and infected people. The virus can survive for rather a long time on surface of items in low temperature environment. The coronavirus did not occur naturally in Beijing, so there are two possibilities for the import of the virus. One is that the contaminated goods were brought to Beijing and the other is that the infected people went to Beijing and spread the virus. We collected biological samples containing viruses. These samples were stored in a low temperature environment. The lower the temperature, the longer it will be kept. If items such as the frozen food are contaminated, the virus can survive on the surface for two to three months. Facing the new changes in the virus, Wu said the measures including wearing face masks and keeping social distance are very useful in blocking COVID-19. The origins of a new cluster of coronavirus infections in Beijing are uncertain. World Health Organization officials have been describing the claim that it might have been caused by imports or packaging of salmon as a hypothesis. Several cities of the Chinese capital put up security checkpoints, closed schools and ordered people to be tested for the coronavirus after an unexpected rise in cases linked to the biggest wholesale food market in Asia. Last week, China reported a new cluster of cases in Beijing after more than 50 days without a case in that city. More than 100 cases have now been confirmed. The origin and extent of the outbreak are being investigated. State-run newspapers reported that the virus was discovered on shopping boards used for imported salmon at Beijing's Zimfadi market 
amid worries about a second wave of the pandemic in China. Mike Ryan, head of the WHO's emergencies program, said in a briefing that he will be reticent that packaging needs to be tested as a result of the new infections. His comments echoed those of experts earlier this week who said the fish itself was unlikely to carry the disease and any link to salmon may have been the result of cross-contamination. According to Mike Ryan, the UN agency is closely tracking the outbreak, which is worrying given its appearance in a major city like Beijing and is in close contact with Chinese authorities as they seek to control it. While a second wave of the coronavirus has already been witnessed in China, the United States is now getting ready with plans to increase the production of ventilators as demand increases. This and other related stories coming up next. Into Brazil and other countries. President Donald Trump said on Monday, June the 15th, that other countries had provided great reports on the effectiveness of malaria drug, hydroxychloroquine, for treatment of the deadly coronavirus complaining that only U.S. agencies have failed to grasp its benefit. His remarks delivered to reporters at the White House came hours after the U.S. Food and Drug Administration revoked its emergency use authorization for hydroxychloroquine to treat COVID-19, despite President Trump's frequent praise of the drug's usefulness for staving off the disease. Yeah, he's asked, he's asked for it and we're sending it. Uh, well. I can't complain about it. I took it for two weeks, and I'm here. Here we are. And we've had some great studies. I didn't know about the report that Jeff asked about, uh, or the statement, but uh, we've had some great reports for coming out of France, coming out of Spain, coming out of other places. Uh, the only place we don't get necessarily reports are coming out of Alex's agency or wherever they come from. Uh, I don't understand that, Alex. What is it exactly? Uh, because I have heard, I have had so many people that were uh, so thrilled with the results from hydroxy. So what is that exactly? Based on new evidence, the FDA said it was no longer reasonable to believe that oral formulations of hydroxychloroquine and chloroquine may be effective in treating the illness caused by the novel coronavirus. Well, at your direction, uh, we continue to study, especially in earlier phase. So. So a lot of the data that has come out uh, that was more negative was people who were quite ill in the hospital. He later said he took the drugs preventively after two people who worked at the White House were diagnosed with COVID-19 and he urged others to try it. And finally on Foreign Dispatches today, imagine standing close to a person and then you hear a beep signaling that you're too close. Well, that's what the new wearable gadget is doing right now in Germany to help curb the spread of COVID-19. Check it out. German electronics manufacturer Fitech has developed a social distancing tracker specifically to combat COVID-19. The device, called the Distancer, is designed to be worn around the neck and Phytech says the wearable gadget enables highly accurate face-to-face -face separation measurements to be made with much more certainty and accuracy than other COVID-19 wearables. We as Phytech are a producing company. Phytech is a producing company and our challenge was finding a way to keep our production ticking while adhering to the safety measures of the coronavirus. There were two important factors to consider and one is a safe distance. As an employer, we are obliged to implement the safe distance. There are many different ways of doing this, like putting down markings. This doesn't really work for us as our processes are too dynamic, so we look for other solutions. The company claims that its device can avoid the unnecessary testing of employees who may have worked within the vicinity of an infected colleague, but did not actually breach the recommended two-meter social distancing rule. The Corona app, die jetzt ja auch in aller Munde ist, die basiert halt auf Bluetooth. The Corona app, which everyone talks about these days, is based on Bluetooth. And Bluetooth is not a protocol to measure distances per se. The app is doing it in a relatively easy way. It measures the signal strength and calculates the distance. Our device is clearly different. It uses, as already mentioned, ultra-wideband. Ultra-wideband measures the time the signal takes to travel from one distance to another and back again. This is a very, very precise measuring method. That means we know exactly how far away the other distance is. 
The device is designed to automatically record whenever two employees wearing the device come within 1.5 meters or less of each other and for how long. Fitech points out that this data is stored locally and would only be uploaded via encrypted Bluetooth communication to customers' own company IT servers. And that's the program today. Thank you so much for watching. Keep up with all our top stories by going to channelstv.com. I'll see you again next time. Don't forget, stay safe. I'm Anne Mwawadu. Thank you for watching.